Happy New Year. Will you pray with me? Father, thank you so very much for who you are, that you are good. God, that you could think so many thoughts toward us, have so many intentions for us, Lord, that are not good. But I thank you for the assurance that you give us in this chapter that you know how you think about us and, and you think thoughts of peace towards us, Lord. You think thoughts that, that give us hope, that give us a future, and we just want to stop right now and praise you that you love us like that. So very thankful. Lord, would you take tonight and just drive the truths of this lesson home in a deeper way in our lives so that, Lord, we're, we're walking in these truths, not just acknowledging and saying we believe, but our lives reflect the fact that we know you're out for our good. And we thank you and praise you for that truth. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. So I said, Happy New Year. Do you know that the uh, Jews don't traditionally wish each other Happy New Year? Instead, they say Shana Tova, Shana Tova, which expresses not a hope for a happy new year, but a good year. Specifically, a year where you are about doing good. And there was a secular study I read about yesterday that was done last year, and it was uh, produced with a title of there's more to life than being happy. And, and what they had discovered that leading a happy life, the psychologist found, is associated with being a taker. And leading a meaningful life is, corresponds to being a giver. So the first use of the form of this word tova is right in the very beginning in, in Genesis 1, where we read God saw the light and it was good. God gathered the waters into the seas and saw that it was good. God saw the fruit yielding seed was good. That the creation of the sea creatures and, and those that were of the land was good. And he concluded with Genesis 1.31, then God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was very good. See, stood back, looked at what he made and said, this is good. It's good for man. It's good for you and me, what he has done. And he placed the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the garden. He placed everything in the garden that would be good for Adam and Eve. But see, they had a choice. They could know evil too. They could know good, God's good, but they could know evil. And part of knowing evil is, is now having before us that choice to think that we can find good in something else or in someone else. That comes, ladies, from knowing evil. And we are in pursuit of good, but what we've done is we've replaced that pursuit of good into a, a pursuit of happy. Eve bought that lie, and you and I have been buying it ever since. The Jewish expression, Shana Tova, takes us back to God's original intention for us, to find God's good in the coming year. And that's literally probably the best definition of it when they say Shana Tova, you know, it's may you find God's good in the coming year. Isn't that better than Happy New Year? Now, in a nutshell, really, that's Jeremiah 29. The people had fallen prey to wanting what they viewed as good, which was a false peace promised to them by false prophets who claimed to speak for God. Jeremiah came and he countered these false prophets, not by telling the people, no, no, God doesn't want peace for you, but telling the people the peace that God intends for you is not the peace that they were seeking. Remember Jesus in John 14, 27 said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. And it reminds me kind of our perception of what, what rest is. We all want rest too, we want peace, we want rest. But mostly when you and I think of rest, we think I want a break from life free from turmoil, a siesta at the beach or the mountains or the desert, you know, wherever 
you envision your rest to be. And Jesus promises us rest. We know in Matthew 11, 28 and 29, he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And, and we need that kind of rest. But in addition to ease and refreshment, this word carries another definition that we often forget or don't even know, and it's this. It's an inward tranquility while one performs necessary labor. See, it's a rest that we can have while we're doing something. Consider the great saints of the Bible. You know, wouldn't you say in addition to wanting a, a peace that enabled them to kind of connect, collect their strength, the rest, that they thought and they knew they wanted a rest that would enable them for God to use them to do the things that, that God had called them to do. They wanted a rest of peace of soul in doing. So again, I think that's part of God's message in Jeremiah 29. And may you and I not miss the message that God has for us. As we look at Jeremiah, we find many, not all the Jews from Judah, now exiled to Babylon under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, God had been warning through his prophets of a coming captivity. And many of these prophets, Isaiah being one of them, uh, lived at that time. But, but these prophets that, that came to the people, they spoke of peace. They spoke of, you know what? P prophets like Isaiah are saying, you know, beware, turn back to the Lord. The nations are going to come. You're going to be taken captive. And these false prophets were saying, ah, it's fine. We're fine, you know. God wouldn't do that. You know, Jerusalem, that, that's God's city. You know, why would God allow his city to be taken captive? Peace, peace, they would say. And really, that's all you and I want. That's one of the major things we want in our lives. I want peace. So we tend to drift towards anyone that will speak peace to us. Anyone that will tell us what we want to hear. Now, in Jeremiah 28, we're told of one of these false prophets, Hananiah. And in verse 2, Hananiah began speaking to the people with the words, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts. And then in a nutshell, Hananiah told the people that God said, I've broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. And within two years, Hananiah tells him, he's going to bring back to Jerusalem the people that were exiled and all the vessels the objects that King Nebuchadnezzar took to Babylon from the temple. Well, you know, what Jew wouldn't want to hear that news? That sounded great. It's like how many of us fall for the, the prophecies of, of politicians today, you know, and they don't even bother saying, thus saith the Lord. They, just, they say, I can do this. This is what I'm going to do. And we think, I want that. I want our nation to be like that. I want this fixed like that. I like this person. And we don't really care how they make it happen. We just hear, they're going to make it happen, and I like that. And for the most part, people look to things like that, and, and, and Hannah and I's message was so positive. But, but it contradicted prior revelation, both through Jeremiah, who said, three chapters earlier in Jeremiah 25, 11, and this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And then Hananiah has the audacity to say, thus says the Lord, not going to happen. Two years, that's it. And see, the people are, ooh, I like Hananiah's message a whole lot more than I like Jeremiah's. But one of these guys has to be lying. And so many of the Jews chose the one that was lying because he had the more inviting message. And then through Moses, he warned the people, choose life or choose death. Choose blessings or choose a curse. And here's an example of what he said in Deuteronomy 30, 17 to 18. But if your heart turns away so that you do not hear and are drawn away, and worship other gods and serve them, I announce to you today that you shall surely perish. You shall not prolong your days in the land 
which you cross over the Jordan to go in and possess. You won't get to stay there. Now, consider the background portion of our homework. It had us look up some verses that described the spiritual condition of Israel at that time. And basically, to sum it up, they left God. They turned away from him, and they served idols. I found this quote last week. It says, It can never be of the Holy One to call people to resist divine discipline and to prophesy peace to those who are away from God. The false prophets were substitute, excuse me, they were substituting their desires and the desires of the people for the burden of the Lord. He's saying, you can't tell people God wants peace for you as you're just walking in rebellion. God says, return to me. So false prophets like Hananiah were not calling them to repentance or to return to God. They were just pronouncing peace and had no call for change. And over and over again, we see God's remedy to avoid calamity was he warned of repentance. It was returning to him. And that's what sets God free to work in their lives and and in ours. We have in Jeremiah 24 some letters. And the first one we will concentrate most on tonight is in verses 1 to 14, the Jewish exiles in Babylon, a letter written to them. And then we have a letter written regarding the false prophets in Babylon, verses 15 to 23. And then there was a letter that Shemaiah had written to the temple priests And Jeremiah wrote a letter addressing that in verses 24 and 29. And then lastly, the chapter concludes with verses 30 to 32, writing to the Jews concerning what Shemaiah had said. Now, because I want to focus on on really the first part of the chapter, the first letter, I want to look at some of the, the key points of the other three letters Many of the people in Jerusalem had chosen to remain in Jerusalem on the basis of promises of the false prophets. They couldn't imagine, as I said, a God that would take their city down and let it remain desolate. They had this false understanding of God. And how many times do we hear that? You know, if God is a God of love, then... And see, these prophets are coming and saying, if God is a God of love, he's not going to let this happen to you. Don't worry about it. But look at uh, verses 17 and 18 or, or of Jeremiah 29. Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will send on them the sword, the famine, and pestilence, and will make them like rotten figs that cannot be eaten. They are so bad. Worse lifts, throw them away. And that's how very often through history, Nations have viewed the Jews, haven't they? Worthless, good for nothing. Let's get rid of them. And here we have a prophecy of this. And then he says, and I will pursue them with the sword, with famine and with pestilence, and I will deliver them to trouble among all the kingdoms of the earth to be a curse and astonishment, a hissing and a reproach among all the nations where I have driven them. Why? Verse 19 because they have not heeded my word, says the Lord, which I sent them by my servants, the prophets, rising up early and sending them. Neither would you heed, says the Lord. But consider the heart of God in Jeremiah 24. The Lord in this chapter, and you can flip back to it if you want to, it might help because I want to read some, quite a few verses from it, Jeremiah 24. He gave Jeremiah a vision of a basket, and in the basket were good figs and bad figs. The bad figs were those who would not heed the voice of the Lord, but rather the voice of the false prophets. And this is what God had to say to the bad figs, those who did not heed the voice of the Lord in verses 8 to 10. And as the bad figs, which cannot be eaten, they are so bad. Surely, thus says the Lord, so will I give up Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his princes, the residue of Jerusalem, 
and who remain in this land and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. And I will deliver them to trouble into all the kingdoms of the earth for their harm to be a reproach and a byword, a taunt and a curse in all the places where I shall drive them. And I will send the sword, the famine, and the pestilence among them till they are consumed from the land that I gave them and their fathers. Now see, they're in God's land. Wouldn't it make sense to stay in God's land? But the prophets had come to them and said, go with Babylon. It doesn't make sense. And so many times the Lord tells us to do something that doesn't make sense. So they stayed. They stayed in what they thought was God's city. And look at the the pronouncement that God made against them because they would not take heed to what he said. But then look at what God has to say about the good figs in verses 5 to 7. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so will I acknowledge those who are carried away captive from Judah, whom I have sent out of this place for their own good into the land of the Chaldeans, for I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them and not pull them down, and I will plant them and not pluck them up. Then I will give them a heart to know me, that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. See the heart of God here? You know, they shall be my people. And that's God's desire. And now notice, this is Jeremiah 24. Jeremiah 24 comes before Jeremiah 28, the words of Hananiah that I read to you, the words that encouraged them to stay. God had very clearly said, go. And Hananiah comes and says, no, 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 stay. It's only going to be two years. And then it comes before Jeremiah 29 which is a repeat of a lot um, from Jeremiah 24 to those who would not listen. He's saying, it's not going to go well with you. So in many ways, this letter uh, recounted in verses 15 to 23 is for those who ignored the words of the first letter. And this letter specifically addressed the words of Ahab, the son of Kaliah, and Zedekiah, the son of Mysiah, The Lord had some words for them. They would be slain before their eyes and roasted in fire. See, roasting in fire was capital punishment of the time. It's believed that these men uh, encouraged the people to revolt against King Nebuchadnezzar, and thus they were convicted of treason and thrown in the fire. See, when we get to Daniel, we're going to study Daniel 3. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends, they were thrown in the fire, same way, except they got delivered. We will see that these men will not be delivered. They will be burned in the fire. And I love how Zephaniah handled the letter sent to him by Shemaiah. I don't know how to say that, and I was going to check it out, but I didn't. Telling him that, that he should be put in stocks. You know, he, he writes this letter and says, do something with Jeremiah, put him in stocks. And I love his response. He just took the letter and he walked over to Jeremiah and he goes, look, look what he said about you. And I love the faithfulness and the loyalty of this man. That's a good guy. And then the chapter ends with Jeremiah's response regarding Shemaiah's words. Thus says the Lord, I have not sent him and he has caused you to trust in a lie. And then God's punishment upon Shemaiah was pronounced. He shall not have anyone to dwell among his people, nor shall he see the good that I will do for my people. Remember, he said two years. No, but God's going to do good. And this false prophet won't see it. Because why? He taught rebellion against the Lord. So both the false prophets and the people who listened to them would suffer And God labeled their sin, not heeding the word of the Lord, as rebellion. And remember, God says rebellion is as a sin of witchcraft. It's a serious thing. But now, I want to look at the good news. Yes, there's lessons to be learned from these other letters. 
basically as, as Moses told them, obey God and be blessed, disobey God and be cursed. And the Lord spoke to Jeremiah to write a letter to those who were the exiles in Babylon. Among those taken into captivity at the time, we will see next week, Prophet Ezekiel. We'll see the week after that, Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, all were part of those taken to Babylon. And his message begins in verse 4 with the words, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Jehovah Sabbath, the one who reigns over all powers and all principalities. What a wonderful way to introduce himself to a people who had been taken captive. And, you know, if, if I were one of those people, I'd look around and say, mm, I think I might call Nebuchadnezzar Jehovah Sabbath. He seems to be the one that rules over all the powers and principalities. He rules over most of the provinces in the whole world. But God's telling him right away, no, no, it's not King Nebuchadnezzar. I am the one that is ruling. So God first reminds us and reminds them of who he is. See, Jesus told us to start praying that way. Start with who God is. So what did he say? How do you start praying? Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Daniel began his prayer, blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. You know, how good that would be if you and I started our prayers like that. You know, you need wisdom, don't know what to do, you're floundering. Ha, oh, Lord, blessed are you forever and ever. Wisdom and might belong to you. And then Nehemiah, when he was praying about taking people to go back to the land to rebuild the wall, he says, I pray, Lord God of heaven, O oh, great and awesome God, what, you who keep your covenant. Remember, Lord, you said you were going to take the people back in the land and reestablish things. So this is his prayer. You who keep your covenant and mercy with those who love you and observe your commandments. So we would be wise to pray in the same way. Identify what's my problem? And then what attribute of God fits that and meets that problem that I have? Acknowledging a characteristic of God that more than covers the fear that we might have. And then the first thought jogger. Look at the last phrase of verse four. Whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem to Babylon. These exiles had lost everything and just but their lives and a few possessions they could carry with them to Babylon. They lost their freedom. They're now captives. They've been taken from their home. They lost their means of making a living. See, no matter how they looked at it, the situation had to look pretty hopeless. And then some of the Jews stayed in the land. And remember, Jerusalem is where God set his name. You know, they were taught that, that God kind of resided in Jerusalem. You want to talk to God, you better be in Jerusalem. And here they are in this pagan country. What are they doing? It's got to be so, so hopeless as, as a feeling. And then they're being told, go back. Two years, it's going to be all over. Put yourself in their shoes. You know, pretty inviting, isn't it, to listen to the false prophecies? How can they handle such a depressing, hopeless situation? How should we, in a situation that, that looks hopeless to us, when we're so tempted by temporary solutions and relief? And so we have part of the answer here. Now, Remember, before I give you this answer, that God's speaking here. See, when you and I speak, we, when you're listening to someone speak, you, you start thinking in your mind, okay, well, that's probably not worth retaining. They're just rambling there, you know, and okay, that I, I need to pay attention to. We shouldn't do that with God. See, God doesn't ramble. He doesn't give us superfluous information. It's everything he says we need to take in. So when God speaks, he has intentions for every word that proceeds from his mouth. Remember Jesus' reminder, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Every word of God is worth paying attention to. So how to handle seemingly hopeless situations? 
Look at the last of verse 4. Whom I have caused to be carried away from Jerusalem. See, see situations as coming from the hand of the Lord. All trials are either sent or allowed by God. He reigns. So everything that hits us, he either deliberately sent or he allowed it to happen. Now, that can only be a positive thing if you know the character of God. To, to, for me to throw out a definition of a trial like that and you think that God might be mean or not care about you, that's a scary statement to make. And so he knows that. And so in a few verses, we're going to be reminded that everything he allows, everything he does is for our good. In 1 Samuel chapter 20, we have the story of David. He's waiting by the rock of Ezel, and he's waiting for Jonathan to find out, is Saul intending to kill him, or is he not? And and Jonathan had told him, you know, I'm going to find out and let you know, and and I'm going to shoot an arrow. If the arrow goes beyond the rock, then you got to go. you got to run. If it falls short, then, then, hey, David, come on back. Get to be with family. Life as usual. Life's good. So David waited, and the arrow went beyond. Now, knowing the story, we would say, that was Saul's fault. You know, evil Saul, jealous Saul. It's, it's Saul's fault that David had to run. But in the story are words, for the Lord has sent you away. And see, I'm guessing if God had not sent David away, David would have been in great danger returning to Saul's palace. It wasn't time for him to be there. So the Lord sent him away. But circumstances would say, Saul did it. When Dale and I were first married, he was in the Air Force. And we were stationed in Phoenix, but we knew orders were coming. And we didn't know where those orders would be. And I remember walking into our apartment one day, and he wrote on our whiteboard, Alaska. And it ended up where I couldn't go with him. And we'd only been married for a year. I broke my heart. But Dale got saved in Alaska. God had to send Dale away from me because you know what my thinking was about the word of God? I've shared it with you. I actually told him, it's no big deal. I read it. Don't worry about it. You know, Dale couldn't live with a woman that knew the word of God, that had that attitude towards Jesus. God had to send him away. And he came back saved. See, God caused Israel to be carried away to chastise them to bring them back to himself. God sent David away to protect him, to prepare him for leading a nation. And God sent Dale away to save his soul. Oh, how I wish I would have understood that at the time. See, if I would have factored in, God sent my husband away because he has a plan for my husband's life and his plans are always good, the lonely nights would have been a lot easier. But instead, I became bitter, and I hated the Air Force because I thought, why couldn't you send a single man up there? You know, it didn't make sense. You don't care. And I dealt with all of that, and I wouldn't have needed to do that. And how often in our lives do we do that? We blame circumstances when God says, I've done this. Look at what God told them to do in verses 5 and 6. Build houses and dwell in them, plant gardens and eat their fruit, take wives, and beget sons and daughters, and take wives for your sons, and give your daughters to your husbands, so that they may bear sons and daughters, that you may be increased there, and not diminished. Now, we're told, especially in Hebrews 11, that we're pilgrims here, that we should see ourselves as strangers and exiles on this earth, and in seeing ourselves as that, we should have a light touch knowing we have a heavenly city that awaits us. But now Jeremiah reminds us here that while we're here, we still have lives to live, and God should be our priority, but still we're to settle in, in a a sense, lightly, but we're to settle in. And he's telling the Jews here that they were not to sit around thinking life would begin when the captivity was over. Ever get like that? You know, a trial hits you, and you just bogged down and well I'm just stuck and there's going to be no joy and until this trial's gone 
And that could have been their attitude. And, and God says, settle in. It's going to be a while. They were supposed to get going with life. They were supposed to increase in population just as they did when they were captives in Egypt. Peter reminds us of how seeing ourselves as sojourners should affect us. He says, I beg you as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak evil of you, of you against you as evildoers, they may, by your good works which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Our Young's literal translation says, in the day of inspection. In accepting their captivity as in God's hand and by God's hand, they're to get on with their lives. And then in verse 7, the Lord instructs them to seek the peace of the city where there it is again, where I have caused you to be carried away captive. See, knowing that, they could pray for the peace of the city. But if they see this all because Nebuchadnezzar is a bad guy and they're stuck and they're captive, they're not going to want peace for that city. See, the Jews were known throughout the world as a stiff-necked, rebellious, contentious people. I was listening to someone talk about Pilate the other day and um, reminded me that the day when Jesus stood before Pilate and Pilate gave in to the cries of the crowd to crucify Jesus was not the first experience he had with the Jews. We tend to look at that story and we think, what a wimp, Pilate. You knew he was innocent and you went with the cries of the crowd. But see, Josephus, who's a Jewish historian, recorded a couple other times when Pilate tried to change things and the Jews stood up and rebelled and were strong and Pilate had to back down. And so we see Pilate now in a, in a new light as Jesus stands before him and, and the crowd is crying out, crucify him. He knows. He knows what's going to happen with these people if he goes against them. And he's, he's okay, whatever you say. The world knew the Jews as a contentious people. And God told them, seek peace. Don't let them see you as the world knows you. So they'll speak good of you. For in its peace, he says, you will have peace. Now, keep in mind, these false prophets were promising them peace. And in this 29th chapter of Jeremiah, God's telling them how to have the peace that they really want, that they long for. Accept what's happening as from God's hand. Settle into life and be a peaceful people. Let me say that again because it so applies to us. Accept what is happening as from God's hand, settle into life, and be a peaceful people. And then in verse 9, God reminds us that he had not sent the prophets that were speaking of a return in the land in two years. But there would be a return to the land, but it would not be for 70 years. Look what God promised to do in 70 years. Pro perform his good. Now, we talked about as good as we began this lesson. See, that's what God does. He performs good. Not your good or my good sometimes when it is contrary to, to him. And, and aren't you glad he doesn't perform your good or my good when it's not according to his good? He performs his good. And look at the rest of the phrase. He'll use it again when he talks about his thoughts in verse 11 toward you. Now think about that for a few seconds. God has good, and, and I think we, we'd all admit, yes, God, and God's good is always good. If I said, do you think God's good is always good? We'd say, oh, yes, of course. But do you sometimes think in his performing his good that he does it in spite of you or regardless of you? Like he's performing good like this overall picture and you as an individual don't really matter in this good that he's accomplishing. We get that he's good, but sometimes we feel like maybe he's left us out. Say the, the president of a company that you're working for, or your husband wor is working for, it says, I am determined to do good for this company. 
And I think the best thing for this company is we are going to pull up roots and we're moving out of state. Good move for the company. Good move for a lot of people in the other state. The other state where people would say, yes, good move. But you're sitting there thinking, but wait, what about me? And see, sometimes we look at God's good like that, like he's doing this overall good, but it doesn't really help us. But then we have these glorious words toward you. Towards you. He wants to do good. And we'll talk about that more in a few minutes. And the sentence ends with the phrase, and cause you to return to this place. He's going to get them there. As he promised, when he promised. And then in context, we have that verse that you and I quote a lot and and hopefully lean on a lot because it's meant to be leaned on. For I know the thoughts I think towards you. Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. He says, I know the thoughts. See, have you ever been accused of of doing something? And, And you might say to the person, I know I didn't say that. I know I didn't do that because I know how I think. Or you might know someone very well that's accused of something and and say that same thing. No, they didn't. They didn't do that. They didn't say that. Well, how do you know? Because I know how they think. And God wants us to be like that with him because our flesh accuses him. Our enemy accuses him. And God wants us to be able to say, no, God wouldn't do that. God wouldn't have that intention. God wouldn't say that. How do you know? I know how he thinks. If we take time to know him, we can know his intentions, not what his thoughts are or understand his thoughts, but we can know the intentions behind his thoughts. See, if we don't, we can so easily fall prey to our own thinking or suggestions of the enemy that God intends to harm for us or at least neglect. And here God reminds his people, I know the thoughts I think. God knows how he thinks. That makes sense, right? I know his thoughts are higher than ours, but he doesn't keep the heart behind the thoughts a secret. He wanted them to know, and he wants us to to know. As God describes his, his thoughts, may we receive what he says as truth. He says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are my ways your ways, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. But see, God's thoughts aren't just better than our thoughts. He thinks differently than we do. See, just as God doesn't say anything without purpose, he doesn't think anything without purpose. That's a whole lot higher and a whole lot different than you and I think. He knows the intentions behind your, your thoughts and my thoughts. Some are good, some are not, you know. But he wants us to know, my thoughts aren't like yours. I don't have some good thoughts and some bad thoughts, not some good intentions for you and some bad intentions for you. I know my thoughts, they're all good. And he wants us to know his thoughts, that they are good. So what are thoughts? God's thoughts are intentions, they're plans. When God thinks, he's purposing to do something. He does something about what he thinks, what he sees. He doesn't just think about you and me. He has intentions for us. So what can we know about his thoughts? God's thoughts, according to Jeremiah 29, 11, they're personal. See, they are towards you. The heavens may declare his glory, but his lips have got to tell us who we are to him. And then he proved his thoughts by sending Jesus. And for those who believe him, he sent the Holy Spirit as his guarantee that he will perform what he promised. And then his thoughts are for peace. See, guilt causes us to think God is out to get us. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. 
not charging our trespasses to us. John 14, 27 says, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Jesus said that in the upper room the night that he was betrayed, the night that he was leaving. And he says, I'm leaving, but I'm leaving my peace with you. Oh, how you and I need his peace. So his intentions for us is in all things that we have peace. People wanted peace. The false prophets promised them peace, and many settled for their peace, which God promised that's going to end in turmoil. See, Satan knows you and I want peace, so he too offers us shortcuts. You see, God doesn't just tell us, don't go after peace or don't go after well-being in that way. He tells us it's not a good peace. It's a false peace. And then he tells us, but I have a peace that is real. And his intention, his desire for us is that we have peace. Now, since God wants peace for us, if we don't have peace, where's the disconnect? See, he wants it. And then his thoughts are prospective thoughts. And prospective means they're thoughts that are expecting something for the future. Thoughts that are expecting something for the future. Our thoughts, at least our, our good thoughts, are, are, are not often perspective. Our, our worries are perspective, aren't they? You know, that's when we get to be future focused. And we can say, I can be happy today if I know my future is taken care of. If I know I'm going to be okay tomorrow. So God not only says my thoughts for you are personal and they're for peace, they're perspective. I've got your future. What a wonderful thing. Psalm 62.5 says, my soul waits silently for God alone, for my expectation or my hope is from him. I remember the literal meaning of the word hope is, is a cord, something to hold on to. God's intentions towards you and to me is to give you a hope that you can hang on to, a hope that these people in captivity could, could hang on to. His intention is that we have peace as we hold on to his promises, whether we're in turmoil or not. Now, that's a very good thing to know about God's thoughts, isn't it? You know, go back and look at that list. God says, I know this. Our God says, I know this is how I think towards you. Don't, and, and don't tell him otherwise. No, no, you don't. You know, really, this is how you think. God says, I know. This is how I think. I think personal thoughts towards you. I think thoughts of peace for you. I think thoughts that, that are to give you hope and a future. Those are the kind of intentions and thoughts that he has for us. So we, we stop at verse 11 and we think, oh, I like that. We kind of bask in it. And, and that's all fine and good. But God didn't tell them that so they could just kick back and bask in the wonder of God's thoughts. You know, that we could sit here and go, wow, I never really thought about that about his thoughts towards me. That's just wonderful, isn't it? You know, that's not why he said those things. Look at the first verse, word of verse 12, then. Then what? Then you will find rest and peace of mind. Well, yes and no. At least no in the sense that it doesn't stop there. God has intentions towards us and he has expectations of us. He expects that knowing these things about his thoughts towards us will provoke something in us. And that something is a desire to come to him or return to him with the intention or purpose of knowing him. Pay attention to God's intention for us as, as far as his expectations. He says, then you will call upon me and go and pray to me, and I will listen to you, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. 
I will be found of you. See, is that a big deal to you that the creator of the heavens and the earth wants to be found by you? See, found means encountered, secured, to get the thing sought. So God is saying, seek me, you got me. And the thing God wants us to seek and promises us we will get is him. And if we believe what God says about his intentions for us, see, we will do something. We will pray to this God that has good intentions for us. You know, I mean, if, if God says, what I have for you is good, and you don't know what to do with your life, wouldn't it be wise for you and me to go, God, <laughs> what do you have for me? What do you want to tell me? What do you want to do in this area in my life? And I think it's important, those two words, to him, that we pay attention to who we are out talking to and that praying will consist of seeking him. This past New Year's Eve at our service here at church, we opened envelopes. And we opened envelopes that contained words that we had personally written the New Year's Eve before. And one of the things we were to write down was a personal prayer request. And, and I remember I, last year I took that as something not especially spiritual, but something I wanted God to do, something regarding my life circumstances. Now, I guess that was part of my mistake, you know, to actually have the mentality of, I don't care if it's spiritual or not, Lord, you know, just fix this. And sometimes we get in, in that kind of attitude. And I thought of Isaiah 43, 19. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And see, I thought for me, most of the time when I pray about God doing a new thing, I'm asking him, really, make it the way it was. Just make it a little bit better. Or fix it, Lord. The new thing it is, is just taking the bad out of something that was and just making it good again. That's what I want him to do. New is just a new and improved version of what I used to have. Just fix what was wrong, Lord. And as I sat considering my prayer request from the last year, I realized, wow, that was my prayer request the New Year's Eve before that. Three New Year's Eves. I've had that same prayer request. And then I realized, wow, I'm really in a place that I'm further from seeing the realization of that prayer request coming to fruition than, than ever before. And I couldn't get my mind off of Isaiah 43, 19, that the Lord's promise, I will do a new thing. New here, see, is fresh, different. I will do something fresh. I will do something very different. We probably have all had plans that didn't go the way we hoped, our, our plan A's. And God often takes our plan A's and, and makes them plan B's. Not that plan A wasn't his original intention. It might have been. But he loves to take shattered plan A's and make beautiful plan B's. See, his thoughts are different than ours. We tend to just work on or concentrate on that plan A, you know, got to fix plan A. And then the question, when God does this new work, he says, shall you know it? Shall you see it or will you miss it? Shall you recognize it or experience it? See, the question was uh, that I was challenged with is, is, am I so set in what I think I need in my plan A or will I see this new work that God wants to do, this, this different work, or will I miss it? In 1 John 5, 14 and 15, it says, now this is a confidence that we have in him. Confidence, something we can be sure of, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. And so the key here is, got to ask according to his will. So it's important that we know what his will is. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 helps us out a little bit. 
Paul says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind and the result that you may prove or recognize or realize what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, those are two really familiar verses. And if, if when I started reading them, you thought, oh, there they are again, you know. My challenge is then you don't get those verses. Because when we get those verses to a point of living in those verses, we say, I want to hear them all the time. Because those verses are, are precious and treasures. So the challenge is, do you believe these verses? And then if you believe them, how is your life reflecting that you believe it? And that's the challenge of Jeremiah 29. The reasonable th response to who God is, is surrender. The reasonable response to knowing God's intentions for us is to call upon him, to seek him. If we believe his intentions for us are intentions of peace, won't we seek him in every life situation and seek him in the form of searching? Now, what is searching? Searching is, in what he is saying here is, I know I can get it, so I'm not giving up until I do. We've got a promise. If we seek him, seriously seek him, we will find him. We will find God. We will get a hold of his will. But I, I think that requires a seeking that's not lazy, but a seeking that's determined, that waits or prays until it gets a sense of what God has for us in a situation. But do we do that? See, again, I know, I know if I seek the Lord, he'll meet me. I know if I hang in there in prayer, I'll get a sense of what he wants me to do. But so often it's just, yeah, no. But does my life show it? By when I pray, I sit there and I seek him and say, Lord, show me what you want me to do here. Show me the attitude you want me to have. Speak to me. Do we believe to that point? His promise to the Jews in captivity was that he would bring them back to their land. Not only those in Babylon, but those scattered throughout the world. And he's done that, not only at that time, but we see the miracle of God bringing the Jews back from nations all over the world and to Israel today. So God wants us to respond to what he said. And then he wants to respond to our response. So his intentions, his plan, what he desires to do in our life is, as we see in the verses here, to listen. He says, you'll call upon me and what? I'll listen, I'll hear you. That's what he wants to do. He desires to be found of us. You know, come, seek me, and you'll find me. He desires to deliver us. And he desires to put us in the place where we belong. He wants to do that because his plans, his intentions for us are that of peace and a hope and a future. See, has Jeremiah 29, 11 become kind of old to you? You know, what if you found yourself captive in a, a situation that was rough and you saw no way of relief and you thought God was out to get you? All the circumstances made it seem that way. Or maybe he's just going to leave you there. And then you started reading Jeremiah and you realized, wow, I'm not a lot different than the Jews. You chose in other ways than God's ways and the result where the bad guys are winning. It seemed like every source of joy you used to know is gone. And then you discovered Jeremiah 29 for the first time. And God's reassurance to you that he actually had plans for you. And they were all good plans. And if you'd seek him, you'd be able to enjoy them. See, God's sovereign. Prayer changes things. He's given this, us this incredible privilege of being a part of his work through prayer. But God's going to do what he's going to do in a lot of cases. And he promised he's going, he was going to get the people back into Jerusalem in 70 years, and he did. 
See, he's going to do that regardless. But if they didn't understand that his thoughts towards them were thoughts of peace, their journey would be a lot more difficult, wouldn't it? That 70 years would have been miserable. Same is true for you and me. See, he's promised, I'm going to get you to heaven. If you're saved, you got it. No matter how you behave, you got heaven. But while you're on the journey, he intends peace for us now. But whether or not we experience that peace, it's up to us. His challenge as we move into this new year where God desires to do new things is, shall you know it? God plans for you. I want to work in your life. Will you know it or will you miss them? And so I say to you, Shana Tova, you know, may you find God's good purpose, his good intentions for you this year and always because his intentions are always good. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for that truth. And God, we all know it. May we live it. May we understand that because your intentions for us are intentions of peace, that we can't wait to come to you and sit with you and understand you're not out to get us, you're out to do good. So Lord, may we be women that are changed because of this, that we respond to this truth, not just rejoice in it, but respond to it. And thank you that when we do, you listen and you deliver and you put us in the place where we belong. May we rejoice while we're on this journey and see and believe your hand is right there. In Jesus' name, amen. Two things. Last week, we lost our precious Dusty Lucas Unlike the Jews who God sent away or Dale that God sent away, God took Dusty away. And we don't get that. You know, I don't get that. Uh, to me, that's really, really lousy timing. You know, considering the, the age of her children and all of that, it, it just isn't wise in, in my thinking. It's, it's not a good thing. And yet, see, but, but I have to factor in the truths of Jeremiah 29, and so do you. See, Dusty's fine. We're the ones that are, are missing her, you know, sat right there, Sunday mornings. And she used to have this ability to know when I just needed little pats, you know, and every once in a while, she'd just reach over and sweep my shoulder, and I'll miss that. But see, God's intentions for Dusty were good. And we cannot forget that God's intentions for Bill and those precious kids are good. See, we, we think, yeah, we know Dusty's fine, but, but what about us? Well, his intentions for us, family and us, they're good. One of Dusty's main things that she would talk to me about is just trusting the Lord with her kids. And she, for the most part, did really well, but every once in a while she'd flounder like we all do and just get scared. And the Lord would kind of bring her back again, and she'd, she had this incredible faith. But right now, Jesse's not worried about her kids. You know, she knows the Lord's got her kids. Now, what does Dusty know right now that you and I don't know? What has God told her that's different than what he's told us? Nothing. She just sees him as he is, so it's, it's sure. But we've got these incredible truths that God says to us. My plans, my intentions for you are good. And even in the hardest times, we have to remember, this is the heart of God behind everything he does. Peace for us, hope for us, a, a future. And so may we remember that as we... Just consider our, our loss and, and we hurt because we, we miss her. And then secondly, that has been on my heart is, you know, in your group you have a board that has gleanings. This is what I've learned. I walk away tonight thinking, wow, this, this is what I've learned. 
But I, I find that too often we go home and say, you know, I'm going to incorporate in this li- that in my life. I'm going to change. And we don't because we, we just get busy. God changes people. And we, we go, I know. And you and I know we're Calvary Chapel. We know the word of God. We know the truth very well. But somehow we can go month to month and look back and think, I'm still struggling with a certain thing. And I want this year to be a year that that we don't struggle like that. And so I don't know how this can work out, and I don't even know if I'm supposed to tell you, but be praying about being accountable to someone. Not in a discipleship sense, but just having someone that you might just have a bad attitude and just say, you know, I'm sick and tired of having this bad attitude. I'm going to conquer it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Will you just hold me accountable? Call me. Get together for coffee, whatever. Maybe even asking the Lord, okay, Lord, I got this whole list of things I need to work on. You know, which one? Which one do you want me to start with? And he'll show you. And it's like, all right. Pairing up with someone and just saying, all right, I want to work on this, and I want you to check me on it. And I think we'll change. And I think that's what we all want. But we just get so busy that we just go from week to week, and we say, wow, that's an incredible truth. But let's let God do a work in our lives this year, you know, so that we walk in the good plan that he has for us. So I'm encouraging you. I'm excited in, in my life about what God's going to do. Just pray about, okay, how do I do that? Who would you like me to be accountable to? Uh, just what is that going to look like for each one of us individually? But seriously saying, okay, Lord, I want to conquer some things in my life. Which one? And start ticking them off, you know, and work on it till you feel like you're getting some victory and then say, okay, now what, Lord? And I'm excited about what he's going to do. So enough of me. God bless you. Enjoy your groups.